This is Carbon Mike. Richard Dellingpole is an artist, a graphic designer, and a Christian. Some time ago, in his native Great Britain, he took it upon himself to bring back the ancient concept of Christian society, slowly, from the ground up, one meeting at a time. We spoke about this and other matters recently on Dangerous Space. Dick Dellingpole, thank you for joining me on Dangerous Space. Well, thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah. Um, so I guess the first and maybe most interesting question is, what do you do? Oh, God, that's, that's such a big question, isn't it? Yeah, that's, it's, um, that's why I asked that first. <laughs> I, I've, I've got a day job, but that's all I want to say about that. It, it does not define me in any way. Um, it's everything else I do in my life. But the day job does mean that uh, everything else I do has to be crammed into those evenings and weekends, you know, just, just like a normal person and uh, keeps me grounded. Um, but among those other things, I've got hobbies and obsessions. Uh, I, I, I trained as a fine artist, so I'm a painter. I, I like to paint in the evenings. I, for the last 20 years, I've been doing reenactment. I, I dress up as a historical soldier. Um, there's weekends that take me all around the world doing that. Uh, <clears throat> and um, in the last two or three years, I, I've gone really quite political as well in setting up a, a, a couple of... Um, now quite active groups one of them purely political the other one religious so in a nutshell that that is me that is dick dellingpole all right well let's let's talk about the religious group that you set up first and then the political one what, what's, okay. what's the religious group well this is almost working um backwards because this is the, the political the the religious group is the um the most recent thing i've set up it, it's been going a little over a year now it's uh as a result of my uh, as my brother would put it going down the rabbit hole um and this particular rabbit hole was the god-shaped rabbit hole uh I, i've never considered myself to be an atheist but uh I've always been what I used to refer to as a lukewarm Christian. You know, you might find me in a church at Christmas, uh, Easter, if you're lucky. Um, I knew the Lord's Prayer. I knew a good few hymns and carols. But that was about it. Um, I was kind of uh, covering my options, uh, you know, just in case God exists. Um, right up until about two or three years ago when I started to think, you know what? That there is definitely evil afoot in the world. Um, therefore, there is the opposite of evil. And it became blindingly clear to me that God does exist. Everything they told me in my religi religious education turns out to be true, and way more besides. And I'd better start, um, better start learning and, uh, and putting my house in order. So I, I started looking around for friends who could help me on this journey, and among them was uh, a chap who was part of my, well, let's call it the political group, Third Wednesday, um, happens to be a vicar, also called Richard. And he was he, he, in the pub one evening. He made this statement. It was mid-lockdown. Everyone was panicking about, um, oh, my God, we're all going to die. And Richard made the statement... Everyone is so worried about their life, but they're not considering the fate of their immortal souls. And I had to think about that one for a few days. And I thought, well, that is the whole point of Christianity, isn't it? That, that this life is just a, a precursor to what we're meant to be experiencing after. And uh, you're, you're really barking up the wrong tree if you're so obsessed with your life here on Earth uh, and, and not thinking about about your soul so that sent me on a sort of a, a really really interesting journey and i started to surround myself with those friends who i knew had a slight or or even quite strong religious leaning and and between us we started a group in a um a vacant room above a pub part of the pub but a a, a, a room that wasn't used that often and initially i think it was just eight of us we we sat around a table and the that the friendly vicar was part of it. And um, 
we just started talking about things. We, we talked about how little we knew about our faith and the Bible, and we were asking the vicar questions, and it's just grown and grown from there. Now, the group is called Thursday Circle. Um, we meet on the fourth Thursday of every month. Um, and uh, we haven't always got the vicar with us. Sometimes it's just a few of us who know a little bit more about the Bible than others. And um, it's named after um, a Bonhoeffer group that he he was the the, the chap Dietrich Bonhoeffer yes. was the chap who fought the um, <laughs> fought the Nazis. He ultimately paid the price. He he was executed by the Nazis towards the end of the Second World War. He he was a Christian who was horrified at the way the the Christian church caved in to the Nazis during in Germany in World War II. And he had started this group of sort of rebel Christians, and he'd named it Thursday Circle. So it's a nod to him. It, it's basically rebel Christians meeting in a pub because for some of us, the church is not for us. That is really cool <laughs> i have to say um i want to I, I we have to come back to this of course because there's so much there uh, but first i want to i want to put what you've just said in some kind of context because it seems like the, you know the the the, the ha talking about having gone down the rabbit hole i mean it's probably the same set of events which sent you down the rabbit hole, that sent me and a whole lot of other people down the rabbit hole. And many of us found different things down there, but it sounds like, if I'm not mistaken, that it was your government's response to the great viral freakout. We're talking 2019 going into 2020. COVID-19 emerges on the scene and, and, and people promptly, well, actually not promptly, they are prompted to freak the fuck out. Exactly so, exactly so. And um, <laughs> the response of the church, and certainly the Church of England and even the Catholic Church over here, um, was not just to do everything the government asked it to do, but to pretty much gold plate those regulations. So there were restrictions put in place, but the church said, no, no, we're closing the churches. Now, we didn't even do that in the wars. Yes. You know, it, 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 it's unprecedented. <laughs> that the church was turning people away right at the time when they could have really done some good. And um, if you go for the standard, what would Jesus have done? He, he would not have shut the door and turned people away. Uh, and um, I, I've been talking to a lot of vicars since then, and though some of them uh, didn't ch shut the church quite as much as they were supposed to have done, um, some of them are simply ashamed that they did what they were told. Now, people are talking about a schism uh, approaching within the church. There's traditionalists versus the, the new wave of wokesters who are kind of, you know, like blue-haired lesbian vicars mm -hmm. and such like. Um, I mean, this is all part of it, that, that there is... That there is a surge of revolutionary spirit going on w within the faith, and uh, the church isn't going to come out of it the same church as it was when the shit really does hit the fan. It, it, this is going to change the face of uh, of worship in in this country and probably across the world, because I'm guessing that whatever is happening over here is happening over there too. Yes, you know, I, I wanted to I wanted to get to that because thinking about it. I mean, going back to, again, the, the great viral panic, right? Uh, this was a time when people were confronted with matters that we had thought we could safely, if not forget about, put in the back of our minds, okay? Suffering and death, mm -hmm. right? We live in a modern civilization. In many ways, it's become a victim of its own success. It's uh, it's big and powerful, and there's you know computer networks and indoor plumbing and internal combustion engines and factories and automation and you know indoor lighting and all these all these things, right? And um, it seems to me that at some point we thought we could we we didn't really have to confront these things in your society and mine. I noticed this in mine a great deal is that people. Um, people seem to avoid the uh, to, to avoid confronting the specter 
of aging by tucking most of the old people out of sight somewhere so we don't have to think about them. That's an unusual thing in human history, right? Mm -hmm. Typically, the, the old people are supposed to be in amongst everyone, <laughs> everywhere, and part of the yep. family, what have you. Uh, so we don't take care of our old people, really, in the family. Um, and we've we've evolved this way of thinking about about disease and about suffering and about all these things as if they are they are merely bad outcomes that once again as per our decades long habit we can turn to the government and ask the government to kind of intervene on our behalf mm -hmm. <laughs> right um so i think it's it's um uh, you and i probably had a similar reaction at the beginning of this thing like well, well what are you i mean i i personally because i would because of what i do for a living i know how to run the numbers um, and so when I started looking at the actual numbers and then looking at how people were responding, my, my immediate response was, well, what, okay, this is bad, but it's not, it's not the end of the world. Why are you people freaking out? Um, well, you, you, you were talking presumably, um, quite early on to the same guy who helped wake me up right at the beginning of the pandemic and that was Hector Drummond yes sir who was similarly on to those figures yes now I'd met Hector through setting up my third Wednesday group that was that's just the political drinking group now he came along to that because he had previously set up a, a group called skeptics in the pub which was pretty much doing the same sort of thing yeah. so he was interested to see someone else doing that thing so I'd made this connection with Hector I got on great with him he's a lovely guy um, and so he was already a friend when the so-called pandemic hit. Now, I was on to his tweets and uh, in message groups with him, and he was saying, you know, there's this guy, Neil Ferguson, who has got a track record of never having been right. He is <laughs> Mr. Wrong. Now, the, these are his numbers. These are the numbers. Um, they don't match up. He's using dodgy software, dodgy methods. He is dodgy through and through. And... I think if you trace it back, both the uh, the U.S. lockdown and our own were based on this one guy's figures. Now, why he was listened to at all is is anybody's guess. But uh, I've got nothing to offer on that front. But I know it's not going to be good. But it, it could all be traced to this one guy, you know, Mr. Wrong. So Hector put me onto that really early on, and. Um, I didn't have to wake up to this pandemic being a scam. I, I was onto it right from the word go. So I wasn't scared and there was no way I was going to have the vax yeah. right you know, right from the beginning. Yeah. One of the earliest podcasts I did was with Hector. Um, and great we're, guy. Yeah, he's, he's wonderful. And we're on the same page about a lot of this stuff. So Ferguson, um, the, look, the, especially uh, around around the the um, the viral freakout. I mean, the the man is a physicist. That is his PhD. That's his training. He's not trained in biological systems. So you can say, well, why was he wrong? That's one question. The real fact, the real question, I think, is why did people respond to government prompting in this way? Why did people respond to these prompts? Why did people? Why, why did it take so little to cause people to do frankly unreasonable things in response to government agents running around with their hair on fire? And that's a deeper question than merely the, the errors of a single um, jumped up bureaucrat. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, well, I, I, I've certainly got some answers for that one. Because yes, sir. it became quite clear early on that the government bought and paid for and owned the media yes sir they owned the television uh, i mean over here you know how bad the bbc is mm -hmm. and every other channel falls into line behind the bbc yes. but the government had uh, they paid for uh front page wraparounds for every single newspaper you know the sort of stuff that um uh any corporate advertiser could only dream of doing but they owned every single paper because they were keeping all the newspapers afloat by paying over the odds for their ad placement. And, and basically, if there was a journalist who wanted to speak out about it, they couldn't do so without jeopardizing the, the cash flow to their paper. So there's the government owning all of TV uh, and printed news and radio, of course. And um, there was a feedback loop going on. 
uh, with the the papers printing stories about this is terrible, you're all going to die, what do you think the government should do by the way you think they should lock us down? And the, pe the people were going, why isn't the government doing more? Why aren't we locking down? Because the, the public don't know. They get their information from the press, which is their first mistake. So there's this feedback loop going on. The public are pushing the government to do something. The government are feeding the, the newspapers the story to scare the public. And this feedback loop just got more and more intense until it got to the point where there were only two questions, not whether we should lock down, but whether we'd done it soon enough or hard enough. And the voices of sanity that were saying, you know what, doing nothing might be the best thing. Um, they weren't heard, except perhaps in Sweden. Now this is now we're 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 going a, a a layer deeper. I I agree with what you've said, but again, I think there's something even deeper. In other words, it seems to me that much of what we saw uh, with this um, with this managed with this engineered panic is the result of something rushing to fill a vacuum. That's what, when you see things moving very fast, sometimes it's because they have a lot of thrust behind them. Sometimes it's because they're rushing to fill a vacuum. And we're coming back to your, your whole kind of theological pilgrimage. I think that, that there, there, the vacuum was in us. And that's why all these terrible ideas were able to rush in and fill that hole, so to speak. I think that and I'd like to get your take on this. I think that a nation, a nation that had not systematically destroyed its own value system, had not systematically gone about divesting itself from its religion, uh, would not have responded in this way to that provocation. It might have responded badly but not this badly. This is something else. This is a wave of propaganda operating, in my opinion, against a population that has no native immune system to reject that propaganda. Now, what, what, do, you, what do you think about that? Um, I, I, I think you're right, and it is a multi-layered thing. It, it, it's a, an onion. It's got layer within layer within layer. And uh, Obviously, it goes beyond governments, but I think what you're alluding to with the breakdown of um, the church and it, it, its influence in society, th this has been a long game. It's been the old slow march through the institutions, and it's not just the church, it's the legal system, it's the education system, uh, it, uh, and the church. And the let's not call them left because you and I know this is not a left right thing yes let's just say that the forces of evil in this respect have have been playing a very long game they they already own both sides of of both of our our political parties you know we we, we talk in terms of the there's not a cigarette paper between Labour and the Conservatives over here, but I, I know you have the same problem with Republicans and Democrats over there. Same problem. Um, here, so yeah. they're, they're, they're all owned by the same people. You know, you, you're, you're allowed the illusion of uh, a choice, but you've got only a choice between the, the, the two terrible offerings that they give you. So they've done this with the church over many years, whereby little by little the church no longer stands for the things we know it, it should stand for, which is it, it quite clearly laid out in the Gospels. Yeah. It, it, it's no longer preaching the Gospel. You might have heard um, James's podcast about mine and my sister's experience of, of trying out our local churches, and we end up getting opinion pieces from the resident vicar on uh, a reinterpretation of the Bible. You know, quite comical in some respects, and it, it's, they're so off the mark but even an amateur like myself, I mean, I'm early days into discovering my faith, but even I know enough Bible to know that some of the stuff they're preaching from the pulpit is completely off piste. You know, they're making it up as they go along. So the church fell a long time ago, and its place in society with it. I mean, we go back to, say, my, my father's generation. 
he's still with us incidentally he's hale and hearty and we, we walk with him on the Malvern hills every weekend um but he would tell me how there were one or two people in the village in village life you would doff your cap to or you would touch your forelock and one was the vicar another would be a school teacher um and there were people who had a really important place in society the vicar now is a nobody in society church attendance is what the churches I've been to have been like a dozen people attending a, a service on a Sunday. Yes. That's a tiny, tiny percentage of the population. And uh, with it has gone the morality, the, the whole of what built Western society has just fallen by the wayside, leaving what you were describing earlier as the void. Yes. But it's not just the church. The, the, the legal system had to be in place as well, because when you look to them to put things right, they're also lacking. They've also fallen. Yes. Uh, it, you know, even the, the medical system. I mean, you know, we, the NHS over here has pretty much taken the place of the church. We, yeah. we worship the health service. Um, I don't know if you ever saw the ridiculous um, performance that uh, we went through over here. I think it was every Thursday. Going outside to clap. Time, going outside and clapping Jesus. and bashing pans. Now, they made out that this was a grassroots thing, that some nurse had come up with it or something like that it, it's bullshit it, it was government propaganda that was orchestrated at the highest level um being passed off as a grassroots thing yeah. but people were out there like performing seals clapping I, i'm proud to say that i never took part in it uh but uh everyone fell for it and yeah this void of, of not having the um their christian faith as their moral compass they're looking elsewhere for their moral compass, and it is whatever the government gives them. Well, so, yeah, it, it, it was more than just the, the fact that the church had fallen. It, it was that the moral void that was left quite deliberately over many, many years. What's interesting about this is uh, the first time I heard someone try to address this in historical terms, I think it was uh, Peter Hitchens. And what he said was that World War I was the beginning of the end for the Christian church in the West because uh, the clergy around the time of that conflict as Europe was kind of sleepwalking or sleep marching into World War I uh, came out on the, uh, thoroughly on the side of the war. For the most part, all the clergy were in favor of it and uh, some, of them even, some of them even painted it as a religious duty to go and fight this war. and. This was going to be this was going to be the last war, the war to end all wars, and mm -hmm. what have you. And what happened in Europe, certainly what happened in the UK, was that many of your best people went out there, and and died. They went into the meat grinder. They ended mm -hmm. up in the mud in Flanders, and you know, choking on gas at at that uh, Ypres or whatever. And um, that those were those were your bravest people, your most patriotic people. Uh, the people who would have been most likely, as as Hitchens points out, to have come back and, and, and started families and been school teachers and pastors and vicars and attorneys and what have you. Uh, you, you, you got rid of the best of yourself. And then the whole pretense of it being the war to end all wars vanished in short order because after a brief intermission, you all did the whole damn thing again. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, here, the story is a little bit different because, of course, World War I was not as devastating to us as it was to you all and, and certainly not to, to the continental Europeans. We got in near the end of it. So I'm not sure how that applies to us here. But what I do know, to, talking about society's relationship to its core hierarchy of values, um, I should back up a minute and say that, that I'm... I'm I'm very much in favor of, of thinking about religion as a hierarchy of values, values that are in a fixed relationship to each other, loves which are in a fixed relationship to each other with a moral absolute at the top. Now, whatever that absolute is, whatever those values are, you have to have that structure. If you just have values and they're mutable or you can shuffle them like playing cards, that's not going to work. If you don't have fixed points by which to navigate, then you're done when it comes time to reason about right and wrong and good and evil. You can certainly do good things in the world. You can be a quote unquote good person when everything is fine. But the moment you have to actually balance things against each other, 
The moment you have to think in a more, in, in a higher order way about what is right and what is wrong. The moment you have to challenge a law. You obviously can't use the law to reason about whether a law is unjust. So that's out, right? You can't use your political system to reason about whether your political system is just or not. That's out. So really the only thing you have has to be from outside of all those systems. And, and, and of course, our ability to reason about right and wrong can't come from nature itself because you just look at the way nature operates and it can be infinitely cruel. So that's out. Mm -hmm. So you have to have some kind of system that is essentially extra natural or supernatural that you use to reason about these things. And, and you know, we have a lot of... Uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, militant atheists who get very up in their feelings whenever you talk about religion, uh, whenever you talk about the supernatural. But the fact is, it is not unreasonable. In fact, it's, it's, it, it makes perfect sense to root these things outside of what is mutable. When you, you, you're navigating in, a, in, in an ocean-going vessel, you can't chart your course according to things you see floating in the water. You have to chart your course, and you do chart your course based on things that are not of this world, based on fixed stars. Yeah. So um, going back to what you were saying, you know, you, yeah, uh, uh, Great Britain is in a kind of a moral vacuum, it's a kind of a moral void. Europe has fallen into a moral void. Uh, and I'm still trying to figure out where we in the United States uh, went wrong. I can tell you that uh, certainly in the in the in the eighties, our um, our kind of national we don't really have a national brand of Christianity, but our relationship as a nation with our Christian roots took a turn for the worse when many of our churches decided to throw their lot in with one political party. And you might have remembered people talking about the moral majority and what have you. And separate from whatever values they espoused or did not espouse, I think this was a terrible idea. Because what it meant was that all of the thing, all the grimy things that the U.S. government was doing, the church was essentially co-signing. And this was, mm -hmm. this was in the middle of the Cold War, or rather more toward the end of the Cold War. But nonetheless, uh, we did a lot of horrific things in our hemisphere and elsewhere, and the church co-signed these things. So over there and over here, it seems to me, and I'd like to get your take on this, it seems to me that you have a problem of scale fundamentally. You get, you get a, a church, an organization that has grown too big on government largesse. It's come up in an environment where the, the government is friendly to it or at least not hostile to it. And in such an environment, I think it's very easy for a church, and especially the Christian church, to forget its roots. And its roots are, of course, in exactly what you're doing, meeting upstairs of a tavern or, you know, somewhere in a hidden room. Uh, the early Christians, they, they hid in the catacombs underneath uh, uh, the Rome. Uh, what's your what, what's your what's your take on that the the, the idea that that Christian Christianity has lost its rebel spirit over the years? Th this is exactly the feel that that we get in the Thursday Circle group. We mm. feel like early Christians, and um, quite often recently we've uh, we sat around a table, all of us around one table, and I, I do a quick head count, and. Quite often, there's been twelve or thirteen of us in a room above a tavern. It, it's almost sort it's... of uh, almost corny, but but we we do feel like you know we, we use the analogy of uh, um, early Christians scratching a, a, a fish icon in in the sand with the toe of their sandal to yes. indicate to a, 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 a stranger that they are Christian that can quickly be scuffed out if they don't get the message. We're almost back to that sort of level, and it's exciting. And it's very real. Yes. Um, we've stripped away everything unnecessary. We are just friends meeting. And we've got Catholics and Protestants and um, high church and low church. We, we've got the full gamut of, of um, the Christian faith within our group. And it, it makes not one jot of difference. We're, we, we get on very, very well. Um, but this, going back to your other point about um, church and um, and state yes. and the separation thereof, which has been kind of a fundamental uh, fact of life throughout British history, that the two kind of have a, a relationship that 
that the two should be separate, but there is a there is a connection. I mean, the the the, the reigning monarch is, is the head of the, the nominal head of the church, church right? Uh, and also technically of the state, although they have no real power in either. Yeah. Um, right at the beginning of the formation of our group, um, there's um, a, a lady who helped me form the group, and she gave me a book. Which is, uh, hear me out on this one. It's quite a relevant story. Mm. It was about uh, a, a vicar in uh, who became an army padre in World War One, and he's a local hero in Worcester, where I live in the Midlands uh, here in England. Uh, and he was known he was known as Woodbine Willie, because when he was out um, in the Western Front serving with his troops, he would hand out packets of Woodbine, which is a brand of cigarettes. Uh, he'd hand out packets of woodbines along with the little Bible that was issued to troops. Um, he, he, when he was with his men, unlike a lot of army padres who would hang back with the, the officers at HQ, he would insist on going over the top. He, he'd accompany them on raids. He'd be waist deep in water in the forward trenches. He'd come under fire, of course, never carrying a weapon himself. But he knew that gaining the trust of his men involved taking the same risks that they took. And he would swear with them, he'd drink with them, he would smoke with them, and he became a, a beloved figure. Um, but he just happened to be the most amazing preacher. Now, back in his church in, in Worcester, he, he could pack them in, standing room only in his church, because of, of how um, hypnotic his sermons were. Uh, so th the church had this um, pro-war vicar who was already a celebrity at home and very fast becoming a, a, a national figure. The church latched on to him along with the state to use him pretty much as a recruiting tool for the war. Um, so it was he, he, he had no doubt that, you know, our boys, are, we, we should be in this war. It's a fight of, of good against evil despite the fact that the Germans had belt buckles with Gott mit uns. On God them. is with you know, us. God is with us. Yeah. The irony, uh, God happened to be on both sides. But a strange thing happened, and that was that during the war, Woodbine Willie, um, actual name Jeffrey Studdett Kennedy, he, he started to completely turn against it. I suppose it's not a strange thing. I mean, he, he's a, a man of the cloth, a man of God. He saw this death and destruction all around him. He became horrified at what he was involved in. So by the time he got back uh, after the war, he was a, a thoroughly anti-war vicar and was preaching as such for the, for the rest of his life. But the, uh, he was also pretty much what we would know today uh, as a, an out-and-out -out socialist. Mm. So the Labour Party wanted to get him on board with them. They wanted to get him... Mm to commit to being a member of their party so that they could use his fame to, to further their own ends. But very cleverly, he refused to do so. He, he said, oh, if I align myself with one party, I'm going to alienate the other. I'm going to alienate half my congregation. I don't want to do that. I do believe that a lot of the things that the church has to handle are political questions, questions of poverty and questions of injustice. And he was there for the poor. But he wasn't going to align himself to a particular party. And I think that that gels in very firmly with what you were saying about how the church had been essentially owned by by the politicians yes. and wasn't therefore able to be its own independent fighting force for, for what was right. Correct. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I commend Woodbine Willie to all, all your listeners. Let's do some research on him. He's a fascinating chap. And... Uh, um, an example to us all, really. Yes, that, that is that is fascinating. I hadn't known about that guy. Um, yes, you know, there is a sense in which this is a problem that there is no formula for contending with. The only thing we can do is be watchful eternally, be vigilant all the time. That is to say, it's always going to any, any church that gets large enough. Any human institution, first of all, all human institutions are subject to corruption because that's the nature of human beings. But then er, any human institution that gets large enough um, is going to be inclined towards self-dealing. 
and the temptation to cozy up to the state, especially when the state is powerful enough to ensure a certain baseline level of, 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 um, of comfort and of well-being, I should say, for, for, for the bulk of its citizens. I think the, the, the temptation for the two to get in bed with each other, I think, is always, um, is always going to be a problem. And he said, well, why can't we have a monarchy? Well, a better historian than I would have to check me on this, but I don't see that, as far as the European nations are concerned, being monarchies necessarily inoculated them against moral error or uh, needless conflict or anything else. Oh, quite, like quite that. the opposite. If you look right. at European history, it's uh, the the the. The would we be better off as a monarchy thing is is an interesting one because a, a good monarchy is a wonderful thing. I yes. mean, it's also yes. the same with a benevolent dictator. Yes. Um, counterintuitive as it sounds, that uh, benevolent dicta dictators can exist. You can have a guy that uh, no one voted for him, but he's doing a bloody good job of running the country. Absolutely. And, uh, I think we can all think of examples, um, but it's. Um, the, the, the same applies to monarchs. Now, Queen Elizabeth, I think, was pretty much universally loved over here because she had the, 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 the gift of keeping her mouth shut on issues that didn't necessarily concern her. Now, she would make all the right noises and she'd um, work with every, every government that was voted into place. She... she she did her duty as a constitutional monarch, but you were never quite sure what she actually thought about anyone. Yes. And we, we could project. We could we could say, you know, though when Trump came over, those who hated Trump were saying, clearly, the, the Queen doesn't like him. Isn't that wonderful? And and those of, those of us who rather liked Trump were saying, you know what? She seems to be getting on really well with him. She's laughing with him, and, uh, and she seems to be very respectful of him, and, and the feeling seems to be mutual. Now... Those two facts can exist side by side, but our new monarch, um, mm. not so much. He, he's always worn his heart on his sleeve. We know what he believes because he, he never tires of telling us. We know he's, uh, 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 he's green through and through. He's liberal through and through. Um, he, he's meant to swear as, uh, into being defender of the faith which is meant to be the Christian faith. But he decided, I don't know if he went through with it, but to say he was going to be the defender of faith, just, you know, just in general. Ain't faith. that's something. Wow. Um, and so, you know, because he doesn't want to upset our Muslim friends and our Hindu friends and our Jewish friends, it's sort of like, well, you know what? You're kind of missing the point there. But uh, so I think the monarchy worked well under Liz, but uh, not so much under Chuck. Uh, I, I'm not a fan, I must say. Well, you know, the other thing is certainly a monarchy with teeth is one that y you would hope could step in when necessary and thwart government decisions that people don't like. If we're talking about mm -hmm. a, a monarchy that operates in, in, in concert with some kind of parliament, right? Which is what we're supposed to have. We're supposed, supposed to, to have, have a constitutional monarch who is there as a sort of like a, a, a last resort if, the, if things get really bad. It, it came about from our, our own civil war, right? Uh, which has a nice tie-in with my reenactment because I started the reenactment reenacting what is known as roundheads and cavaliers, which is which was a bit... A Victorian term for mm -hmm. parliamentarians and royalists. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I was in a parliamentarian regiment, and we'd go off and do big battles, uh, just like your own uh, American Civil War reenactment societies over there. And funnily enough, we have them over here too. But uh, big battles with matchlock muskets and pikes, and it was uh, um, Morian helmets and uh, leather tabards and all this, all very jolly. But that was the part of history where we came up with the idea that a monarch should not be absolute because that leads to the, the corruption and megalomania that we experienced through Charles I. Um, and, but also Parliament needs to um, have checks and measures in the form of a monarch. So the two were supposed to be kind of like a, a, an upper house, a lower house, and, uh, and then one beyond it. So we had the House of Lords, we had the House of Commons, 
and uh, and then we have the monarch. And between the three of them, you, you think that would be the whole thing nailed down, but but no, that gradually they the one loses power, the other becomes too strong, corruption yeah. creeps in, uh, and before you know it, even that system didn't work. And this system is supposedly the envy of the world. Right. Uh, yeah, because you think about it, there was no one, including, I don't mean to speak ill of the dead, but I mean, your monarch did not step in and say, hang on a second, why is my government, because technically it is her government, that's how they talk mm -hmm. about it, why is my government uh, trampling on the ancient liberties of my subjects? Well, she, she bought into the whole thing. She, she had the same people whispering in her, in her ear that were whispering in the ears of government. So they have their advisors, and a monarch is only as good as the people advising them. Yes. I mean, how, how else are they going to be in touch with what's really going on in the world? Right. This is, this, is why, this is why I think the problem of scale, you know, our, our friends who call themselves Christian nationalists online and so on and so forth, I think, I think that, that where they, that they're correct in thinking that a limited government can only properly govern a self-governing people, which is to say, in one sense or another, a moral and religious people. That is true, I think. But the question of scale always comes back to, to bite you. That I also think that. And so, uh, because governments are human institutions, um, you know, kings and queens and their retinues, they're human institutions. Uh, churches are human institutions. And so uh, I don't have a formula for, for how, we, how we deal with that. It's, it's just I think maybe we just have to get right with the fact that there is no formula. We have to keep our eyes open all the time. And when we see, when we see things getting too big, when we see institutions getting too big and too comfortable and too happy and too fat, we know that there's a problem. Um, and here, by the way, is where Christianity itself uh, gives you s some 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 great archetypes, right? Uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, you said something about rebel Christians, and I thought mm -hmm. rebel Christianity, and I thought that's almost uh, that's almost redundant to say rebel. You're almost repeating yourself when you say rebel Christianity. Christianity is the is the ultimate rebel religion. Yeah, right? yeah. I get um, you. And so. Uh, I think that it's I think it's great to see people doing that. I was talking with Father Jamie Franklin a while ago about what I was calling roots Christianity because he was very upset about what he saw going on in the country. And I said, yeah, we need Christians to make Christianity weird again, to make it to, to make it dissident again. Yeah, uh, and, and, and I think right. that's exactly what those irreverent boys are doing. Yes, they, yes. They strike just just the right uh, note of. Uh, fun, rebelliousness, um, coolness. I mean, the, when the church tries to make itself cool, it's just so Oh, my so God, cringe. it's, 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 it's the it, worst. It's yeah. buttock-clenchingly embarrassing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it's, it, um, it's not going to bring anyone on board. If anything, it's going to scare away those who are already there. And there's this whole thing about trying to bring in young people, like young people are the answer to everything. And, yeah. You know what? That they're, they're not interested, and we've discussed this a lot. And as you may know, I, I, I've, I've been in regular contact with those reverend boys and mm. uh, uh, met them in person. I love all three of them, yeah. and um, that they are doing amazing things for faith in this country. And they won't be recognised for it for, for quite a while to come because because they are the rebels. Yes. Now they are bringing people on board to to Christianity who wouldn't have given it a second look. And uh, they're doing it not by making it easy. They are right. presenting faith as it is. It is a difficult thing. It should be difficult. Nothing worthwhile is easy. Um, you know, anything worthwhile has got to be strived for. And uh, I mean, for me, the, the 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 difficult thing with Christianity is forgiveness. It's a really tough thing to forgive people that you hate, yes. and you shouldn't have hate in your heart, and all of these things. And, are uh, 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 brushed aside when the church is trying to attract people and saying, look, it's really easy. You can, you know, bring your pets in, bring your motorbikes in. Um, 
It, ha- have a great time. Let's have messy church. Bring the kids. Let them do right. their coloring. They can scream and shout. Well, we'll um, have a, we'll have a DJ during the the, the liturgy. You know. <laughs> oh yes, all of it. I, I've heard of vicars sitting on the altar, swinging their legs. And, oh uh, come know, on. Uh, it, it, it's um, let, let's hang the rainbow flags around. You know, yeah, br- no. bring your gay partner along. In fact, what? Let, let's marry you. Um, it's this whole thing about taking away everything that is difficult about the church yes. in desperation to get bums on pews. And in the process, they are killing the church. Yes. And uh, uh, and what those irreverent boys are doing is actually presenting old-fashioned grassroots, gospel preaching, praying, psalm reading, Christianity. And uh, it, it's... It's not difficult because it, it, it's been practiced for hundreds of years. Um, but it, it's radical thinking to, to look back to the Bible, to, um, to, to pray regularly, to look after your fellow man, to put others before yourself. Um, and yet that's what these guys are doing. Yeah. I mean, this is uh, it's very encouraging to watch them work. And uh, that's the kind of thing. I think we need to see more of, you know, the, you, you were talking about uh, uh, th- these kind of ham-handed attempts to get young people interested in Christianity. I think one of the best ways probably to get young people interested in these kinds of things is to is to show them for what they are, which is a kind of adventure. Figuring out your fundamental philosophy of things, trying to understand this kind of enormous mystery that we're kind of embedded in. That's almost the ultimate adventure, certainly if you're interested in the life of the mind. You all especially do have a tradition of Christian pilgrimage, uh, which, which I really uh, kind of cottoned on to when I started reading, uh, reading certain books and, and what have you. Um, and that's what I think of myself. I just think of myself as, as a pilgrim. I, you know, I, I had been kind of reasoning my way back to faith slowly over a few years, and then I think probably the the the, the great vowel freakout was probably a tipping point for me, um, because I saw how even people who styled themselves as avatars of rationality, and how rationality was all you needed, and what is you know you 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 stupid backward Christians with your weird myths and your and your books and your kind of troubling verses and so on and so forth in the Bible. We don't need any of that. We're modern people here. We have rationality. We're not, we're not, um, you know, we're not like you primitive people cowering from uh, things you can't see and what have you. And then what happened? What happened? A couple of governments clapped their hands a couple times and these avatars of rationality, these modern people, started cowering like cavemen at things they couldn't see. It was extraordinary. <laughs> well, yeah. wow, okay. <laughs> really? Okay. Because five and minutes ago... they can't ago, see the irony in it either, well, can they? Well, well, they, well that's they, right. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, well, five, five minutes ago, you people were talking as if you had all the answers. Now look at you. You're telling me to be afraid of air. Are you listening to yourself? You know, and we can go back. I mean, someone needs to download all these articles before they get memory hold. We can go back where where these people have said, you know, well, I think we're just going to have to wear masks everywhere forever. <laughs> you know, and we're just we're just never going to shake hands with anyone ever again. And oh, we just yeah, have the, to. The, the, the new normal. The new normal. Exactly. To it. Right. Now, uh, uh, mm. you're probably familiar with Zuby. Yes, sir. Uh, who's a, uh, uh, who's a, a great chap in his own right over here yeah. uh, and dj and uh, uh, international man of mystery now he put out a tweet the other day that was ask- inviting people to um contribute the the silliest rules that we had to put up with under lockdown and this t- this tweet just took off it went nuts it, it <laughs> bombarded with stuff my own contribution was mm-hmm. point re- reminding people that the government reserved the right to take down, burn to the ground, destroy any building yes, they I felt remember that. become uh, effective. Now, yes. uh, you were talking about memory holding. I can't find an article about it in the newspaper about this. Interesting. Uh, I've got a feeling they're taking stuff away yes. even now. Now, we need to keep receipts, as they say. We yes. need to remind – someone's got to – as you say, someone's got to take all this down because – 
these these journalists will re-emerge as like, yeah, well, I, w- I was always an anti-lockdowner. Yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. we'll be able to hold up a piece of paper and say, really? But aren't you the guy who wrote this? Correct. Um, uh, they were vaccinating animals in zoos and the animals were dying. And it, it, it's the, some of the madness that we endured. And those of us on the awake side of things were just... We, we had our heads in our hands. We, we we couldn't believe it. We couldn't work out why people weren't waking up to it. But you've got to remember that, that, that whatever applies to how awake we were about lockdown, mm-hmm. it's the same thing with faith uh, on a different level. We've got to remember what it was, lo- how we may have once looked at Christians. And you were saying, you know, with your crazy books and your mm-hmm. your, your men in dresses and uh, it's all smiles in the church and singing songs and your sky fairy and all of this sort of stuff. It, it's, it's easy to forget how we look to non-Christians, to, to non-believers. We just look like weirdos. Um, if we're presenting the answers, we've got to come across as someone you can trust in the first place. Which is why I think it's really nice to to take the faith bit out of the church and bring it into a pub. And uh, the the response that uh, when I was hanging out with the um, the irreverent guys in um, they did an event in London, and I was invited to go down and, and talk at it, which was a fantastic uh, do. But being in a pub with a vicar and a dog collar that they get quite a weird reaction. People want to come and talk to them. People want to come and ask them questions. And uh, my, my vicar friend, Richard, he's bombarded when he goes to his local pub in his dog collar. He might just be passing through. He doesn't go out of his way to do it. But um, he, he ended up one time being asked to bless the pub. Um, wow. The, 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 a couple would come up to him to discuss their marriage, um, or, uh, their forthcoming marriage that they, they were thinking of having in the church. And this sort of stuff, if you take this to people, you'll find that there is a real thirst for it. People do respect the church, even those who don't believe, yes. which means that they appreciate the, the, the part that Christianity has played in in the creation of society as we know it. Yes. They know that even if they then don't self-identify as Christians, they, to, on some level, appreciate that these guys represent good. Yes. And, uh, and maybe they are worth listening to. Yes, I think that's, that's exactly right. I think another thing that's very important about that is I've heard Christians describe it as, as kind of winsomeness. That is to say, not that you're supposed to uh, drape difficult truths in happy talk, but more like you were supposed to be, you were supposed to show a face to the world as Christians uh, that is um, that is at the very least encouraging. That is, um, that shows, hey, these people, these people are not just, they're not just complaining, in other words, about how bad everything is. They, 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 they seem to be they seem to be looking at something that's beautiful, you know, mm-hmm. and many of the, 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 one of the problems is many of the people I've seen for myself online, um, who are talking about these things, uh, they, if, if I imagine that if you could see their faces, that would be, it, their faces would be in kind of perpetual scowls. That's a problem. That's a problem. I think that one of the things that your approach and the, the, the approach of the uh, reverend guys is so is so good with is kind of bringing uh, kind of earthly joy and humor and all these things back into the mix. And it seems to me that those things were in the mix in the first place. I've been obsessed lately with the Sermon on the Mount as an example of something that when it happened probably was was even more interesting than it's painted in the literature. What I mean is this. Um, Christ was kind of a scruffy Palestinian hanging out with scruffy Palestinians, often in the worst parts of town. He was hanging out with lowlifes and, you know, rough publicans types. Publicans and criminals, I and think it criminals says at one and, point. And, and, but it's funny how publicans get put, put <laughs> Exactly right. the same translation. But, yeah. <laughs> no, right? Right. Well, 
It, which implies that he's hanging out in bars. Well, know, that, that's what I'm saying. And look, there was at least one prostitute in the squad. We know this, right? Yeah, we do. We do indeed. Now you look at the Sermon on the Mount. Like I, I try to, I try to kind of, um, I try to kind of imagine when I go in and read that, that piece. I, 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 I think about well, what does that mean? It was up on a mountain. So you imagine this, this, this kind of ancient, dusty, grimy city, and. At ground level, especially around the docks, maybe everything smells bad and, and what have you. And it's, you know, there's people in this crowds and there's dust and there's smells and all this. And then and then you go up on the mountain where the air is clearer, you know. Mm-hmm. And so you imagine you, you imagine this 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 weird rabbi with his ragtag band of people up on a mountain. He's just talking with him. And. Uh, if you know anything about uh, you know working class people, you know that they're always joking around and 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 goofing off, and, and they always like to like to have a good laugh. And and this is true of Palestinian working class people just as much as anyone else. They're going to have been heckling him, aren't they? And, well, well, this is the thing, and I I specifically thought of um, I specifically thought about uh, that that line where um. Uh, what is it? Uh, it's, it's the beam and the, and the, the moat. You know, where, what, why do yeah. you why do yeah. you uh, point out the moat in your the, the 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 moat or the splinter in your brother's eye when there's a beam in your eye? Now yeah. this now this is hilarious. Like I make furniture, I work with dimensional lumber. I know what a beam is, <laughs> right? The the idea that he you know to, to say yeah you've you've literally got a beam in your eye is yeah. absolutely hilarious. A That's a, it's just, right, exactly. Yeah. It, it is comical. It's comical, and you know the the humor and the mirth in this is something that is necessarily going to have been bleached out by centuries of scholarship. Okay, and that's that's. That's this understandable. Is so true. I mean, but, we, we know that hu- humor and laughter is a gift from God. Exactly. And, uh, uh, it, it's it, you can so easily strip it out of the Bible, but that's if correct. as you read the Bible, you, you imagine you, right, right, a cheeky grin on, on, on Jesus' face, a wry smile, that's maybe right. a little wink. That's <laughs> right. That's right. And, and you can imagine the you know, the disciples hearing that, and they're and they're laughing. They're like, you know, like and say, yeah, I, I see you, Simon. What are you going to do with that beam in your eye? <laughs> you know, yeah. you're going to make a table. What are you making a table today? What's going on? You know, right. So, so this is, this is something that, that, that people can bring back without, uh, descending into kind of moral therapeutic deism, you know, God wants you to be happy. God wants you to make a lot of money. You don't have to do all that, but, Mm -hmm. uh, but, but that's something we can bring back and, and we we can, and, and that also can be a gateway drug for people. Uh, where we can start to talk about more difficult things, but but the uh, fundamentally this this means that again this question of scale, you know, we have to scale down from these grand serious institutions. You know, big institutions don't have a sense of humor. That's just that's just how it is, right? Big, well muddied institutions do not have a sense of humor about anything, uh, and that's a problem. So again, I, I think it's it's great work that you all are doing, and I I, I um I hope that there's more of that. I hope that, that we see more of these uh, more of these ragtag groups of people meeting in basements and and above well, tap rooms. The way, rooms the way and what I've have set you. it up is yeah. uh, is that I've um with, with Third Wednesday, the political group. Yes. I, I, I sell it as libertarian drinks, and libertarians hate being defined as libertarians. So. It, it, it's for want of a better expression, but essentially they're meeting once a month in a pub and there's no rules. It's just people who are like yourself are going to be there. Now, with the with the Thursday Circle thing, I've done the same thing. I've set up a website. There's a map with dots on it. Mm. And where there is a dot, there is a meeting going on. So if you want a pub for your Wednesday, then it, it's on the one website. But for Thursday Circle... I want people to see if there is one near them. And what I say with both groups is, look, if there isn't one near you, had you considered setting one up? Yeah. And um, this is how it's happening. I- I'm not going down to any of these and telling them how to run things. I say, look, the way we're doing it in Worcester that works really well for us is this. Now, this is part of my libertarianism. I, I hate telling people what to do and how to do things because... Things sort themselves out. People find their own way of making things work. And um, we, we've got a system that whereby only one person is talking at any given point. There's no talking stick as such. Mm-hmm. We just try to be a little bit more respectful than you might be in the average pub meetup and, and let 
someone say their part and then someone else will will, will take up and say but had you considered this um it, it's very civilized and it works really nicely but far be it from me to go to other groups and say no no you're doing it all wrong so there's a libertarian me that doesn't want to govern these things but there's the <laughs> almost evangelical me that wants these things to happen so badly across the country because I want people to get from it what I've been getting from it, yes. that I'm almost getting ahead of myself in my eagerness to, to try and make this thing happen elsewhere. Yes. But it's a slow burner, but it, it is happening. The, the groups that have, have taken off have really worked well, and people are saying they've, they've made some amazing new friends, and uh, people are coming out of the woodwork who have really been thirsting for this sort of thing you know sort of a church outside the church um our our, our friendly local vicar who, who comes along was telling us look don't don't let the church anywhere near this they will try to own it they'll try to make it their own um grassroots has to come from grassroots you can't decide to create a grassroots organization from above yes uh people have tried and people have failed and uh, it, 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 it can't be owned by any particular church, this thing. This is people. And as, as we, we know, people are the church. Yes, yes. I think this is, this is the right time for something like this. The, the, the large institutions, again, they're just too big. Many of them have been corrupted as a, simply as a consequence of their scale. I don't make that indictment only of the church. Governments seem to be quite obviously even more corrupt, uh, again, partly as a consequence of their scale. But in terms of solutions to these things, scaling it down is a thing. I mean, you hear Catholics talk about this. They talk about subsidiarity. How can we push decision making down to the lowest possible point where the information is, where the decisions are have to be made, uh, where people can see what's going on? Uh, you know, street level Christianity, roots Christianity. Um, it's it's a it's a to me it's a, we're, just, we're just hearing about hearing you talk about it is wonderful. This seems this seems like like something that can start to start to create something to grow something in that void. Um, that that that's been that, that that void that's been created for one reason or another, um, and into which all kinds of terrible ideas are flowing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, this this seems to be uh, uh, th this is a great thing that you all are doing. I think. Well, the the, the other as you say, terrible things are flowing into that void. It, it, let's let's not beat about the bush. This is the work of Satan. He he is having a great time out there right now. He is filling the void in a lot of cases, and it's through all the things that they that they warned us about. That uh, back back before I was a, a half decent Christian, I'd just laugh at them. You know, that t them telling me that rock music is a, is a route to Satan. It just seemed like a ridiculous thing to say. But the the more I find out about the music industry, the music the industry, I, <laughs> right? The more I find out, you know, that was totally right. Yeah. Um, it's only even scratching the surface of, of how right that is. But um, yeah, it's sort of learning everything I do. I've already been told, which is uh, um, quite quite an eye opener. But yeah. just you know, reading the Bible a little every day because I want to, not yeah. because I feel I should. But I actually look forward to to, and I'm simultaneously reading Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, you know, one in the afternoon and and one in the morning, and uh, it's it, it's become a, a great comfort to me. Uh, saying prayers three times a day, uh, just as my brother is, learning psalms. It, it's th There's things you can do to improve yourself while you're helping others and just little by little trying to make sense of the world, make it a better place, help those who want to come on board. And, you know, I really do feel like I'm doing something, and that is hugely satisfying. Yes, yes, I think so. You know, uh, people listening to this, I know there are some people listening to this who, who will think, who will say, well, uh, there isn't there isn't all that much theological rigor in meeting in a tavern or above a tavern or what have you, and maybe there's not, but I would, I would say this. It, it strikes me that, um, well, I'm always going back to this, um, this talk that Roger Scruton gave, the late Roger Scruton, um, 
it was about beauty, and he was taking questions from the audience. And someone asked him, how do you get young people who were raised on pop music, you know, soulless pop music, Lady Gaga mm -hmm. and so on, how do you get them to be interested in things like Bach? And what he said was, you don't, not directly. What you have to get them to embrace is silence first. Get them to where they're at least comfortable with silence. And then it's, it's out of that silence that the appreciation for things like Bach can grow. Um, a few of the theological thinkers and the Christian apologists I respect have said something the same, something like the same thing about Christianity. Is that how do you get uh, uh, an atheistic society um, or a nihilistic society to, uh, to declare for Christ, so to speak? And I think it was C.S. Lewis who said, uh, who thought that even, he thought that even pa embracing uh, paganism was certainly not as good as embracing Christianity, but it was better than nihilistic materialism. In other words, if you can get people away from nihilistic materialism, if you can get them to start thinking that the world is alive and it's thinking, you know, and that you're a part of it, if you can get to, if you can get them to see that everything or everyone around them is not simply meat, right? Mm -hmm. Then that could well be a gateway drug into, okay, then what's, what's the plan behind that? What's the schema behind that? Um, and, and I think, I think many of us who are, who are impatient, I have a lot of, uh, of, of Christian friends who are, who are impatient for this kind of reawakening because they see what's going on and, and they see uh, quite correctly that uh, we're in a bad state and they understand, again, correctly in my opinion, that, uh, that this is a spiritual war. It, it's not going to be won on political grounds, even though politics matters to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be won on informational grounds, although information, of course, matters. Um, it's got to be won or lost on spiritual grounds. And so there are a lot of people who are, who are, who are anxious for this kind of reawakening, but um, the, the, it's, the, there's nothing for it but just to understand that, that uh, the first thing is you gotta kind of meet people where they are. And if you're gonna challenge them, well, you, you gotta challenge them where they are. Um, but I think this is, this, is a, this is a beautiful challenge. It's a beautiful challenge. Um, come, come, come talk with us, come reason with us. Uh, well, it's, it's, it comes back to the, the, the vicar in the pub bit. Yes. People are comfortable in the pub. I mean, you, you must know the, the part that the pub plays in, in British society yes. and life. It, it is, it, it is the public forum. It's the meeting place. It's the exchanging of ideas. I always gravitate towards an old-fashioned pub without a jukebox or any sport on the television. Yes, um, uh, where they've got real ale behind the bar, mm. and it's normally full of uh, old men. But uh, you know, they described as old man pubs. It, it's but there's a liveliness there, and there's um, it, it's familiar and it's comfortable. Now, take people when they're in a comfortable, familiar place, and then challenge them with with ideas rather than right. getting them to step into an alien environment which is the church which might be cold and weird and uh, you know we're all vaguely familiar with it but it, it's not the comfortable place uh, and uh, you're you're already on someone else's turf but if the ideas come to you on your home turf or at the very least neutral turf it's it, it, it's a great place for exchanging ideas and uh, um, challenging people's uh, preconceptions it, it really does work yes yes speaking of place you know i was as you've been speaking i've been thinking about um kind of uh, well about foundationism about our the, the the kind of archetypes we like to think about in in the foundationist society and how that would map on to this kind of thing I mean, in foundationism, we have there are ten precepts. Uh, I, I read can... them before we, we we came online, and I've, I've got them written down in front of me. Oh, beautiful! I, I, had a, I had a feeling. I mean, it, they're, they're beautiful. Well, I, thank it, you. It's, uh, there's nothing I 
I, I love a good succinct manifesto. And, well, thank uh, you. <laughs> uh, it, it really lays it out. But, um, well, very. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I tried to make it to, as succinct as possible. I was tired of these political groups with their <laughs> with their you know fifty page manifestos. I'm like none of that. <laughs> very mm. simple. Very inward and and all we're inwardly in, directed. Yeah. We're in a world of tilde, aren't we? Too long didn't read. It's, uh, <laughs> that's right. You, you, you don't want a tilde manifesto. That's right. That's right. But um, aside from the the ten points in the manifesto, which by the way. Anyone who's listening to this right now should go to the Infinite Jigsaw podcast uh, that's run by my buddy, Danny Duran, who's also a foundationist. I, I, I've done one with, with Danny. We, we, and you, we, you, we talked you, about Brave about New, World, New World. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, was a great, that was a great episode. So yeah, the Infinite Jigsaw podcast is great on, on its, in its own right. And Danny's talked to a lot of great people. And he and I did a 10-part series where we simply went through the, the, the points of the manifesto one by one. Right. He'd ask me questions about them. These great conversations, but then we have the archetypes as well. So we 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 think about things in terms of three archetypes: the forge, the library, and the tower. And so the forge is the locus of kind of work and practical application. The library is the locus of study and research and historical investigation and documentation. And the tower is the locus of theology and religious feeling and the moral law, right? And mm -hmm. so you could see right away that these things have to be kind of in, bal in, in balance in one's life, right? If, you, if you're all in, if you're always in the forge, but you're never in the library, you're blind to history and you're not writing things down. Um, if you're always in the library, but never in the forge, then you're book smart, but you don't you don't do enough practical application. Mm -hmm. And if you're either in the forge or the library, but you never go to the tower, then then you then what you do is not infused with meaning. You're kind of flying blind. There is no moral law. So now I'm thinking about uh, your kind of uh, 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 kind of impromptu societies and how. Uh, the, the, certainly, I think about how masculine society often used to involve, for example, going to someone's house who had a garage and you guys would wrench on cars together, you know, or mm -hmm. or reading groups. Right. Or going on a retreat in the woods and just lighting a fire and sitting around and talking about whatever. So th there's like kind of there's the Ford spirit that, you know, people can start their own kind of societies where they discuss things and whatever and, and they can and they can kind of base them around some place that represents the forge where men get together and kind of actually do work together um or or again reading groups libraries reading rooms so on and so forth or silent retreats or quiet retreats or you know going somewhere off in nature that's where, where you can't hear anyone else and you're just and it's just you know a bunch of men sitting around the fire um there's so much. I mean, this this is uh, this is such a broad template uh, that it's 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 exciting to hear you talk about it and and to try to think about how how people can make that happen where they are. Uh, and the only the, seemingly the only requirement for this is that it not be on social media. That it be actually in a place with real people who you can sit down and talk with. IRL um, is everything in real life. It's, yes, sir. Um, it, it, it's uh, I've realized that, in fact, this is almost paraphrasing a, a speech uh, I, uh, my brother James was, was making recently. Everyone, whether they know it or not, has a particular superpower. And it turns out that mine has been to bring people together. Mm. Um, and I, I, I somehow, I, I was never really comfortable socially growing up. I, I wasn't very outgoing, and uh, I, you know, I was always the clown. I would always be, uh, be, be the jester. But as it turns out, that kind of matured into being comfortable around all sorts of people and really getting a kick out of bringing people together. And this is this seems to be my superpower, and I, I, I'm, I'm. God's got hold of it now, and uh, <laughs> and he's he's hopefully working through me to to make this thing happen. And if that's what I bring to the world, and if that's uh, what I end up achieving, I'm completely content with that. That's amazing. Did you? I wanted to ask you: Had you already been aligning with faith more closely, and then the kind of great vowel freak out just tipped you into it, yes. or, or was yes, it? Yes, yeah, I, yeah. I think I was like. 
I, I'd been starting to want to wonder about what that kind of void in my life was. And I, you mentioned paganism earlier. I'd even tinkered with the idea of, you know, maybe I should be looking back at ancient British history and seeing what they worshipped. And you know, there was something uh, uh, looking for spiritualism, which you also hinted on earlier. Um, and th there was something that needed to be filled and ultimately it was it, it was christianity that that uh that, that arrived in time to prevent me going down any any of those other routes but uh, which is not to say I, I i disrespect those who have chosen the a more spiritual route but accepting that there is something beyond the obvious in life something we can't quite understand uh, it is the first step to to any of this increasing your own awareness uh, accepting you know nothing is the first stage, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Well, what, what's interesting, I think, about as I read about the history of Christianity, is that the ancient pagans were successfully evangelized. Uh, I can't remember. I was just reading about this guy, and I can't remember his name, but it's the guy who evangelized the Picts over in over in your country, and. Um, uh, I've, got to, I've got to learn up on this stuff yeah, because I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I know it was uh, St. Patrick over in Ireland. In Ireland but, uh, but there was it, no, yeah, yeah, there was yeah. another one down in England. And, the, and then, the, the and early then the, saints. Basically. Yeah, the early saints. And then there was another one who uh, who evangelized the um, the Slavs. I believe that was St. Cyril. And um, and I even even now they, they, they write in an alphabet that has his name, Cyrillic. Um, right, yeah. And so... Uh, this is, yeah, the, it, it, it's very interesting to hear about the paths that people took. I mean, I also, like a lot of, like a lot of uh, men, I also um, took in my fair share of Jordan Peterson and he just hearing him, for example, fill up auditoriums and talk about Genesis was fascinating. You know, mm -hmm. I had never really heard someone who wasn't specifically asking you to declare for Christ, but just talking about these stories as if they mattered, you know, and that's another thing I mean about the way we approach this thing, the way we approach young people. Uh, the, the adversary is clever and uh, knows how to paint a picture uh, and knows how to kind of bait our side. So it's very easy to fall into this kind of back and forth. And, and then, then you, you just get, end up very, getting very shouty as you defend things that need to be defended. But the problem is that um, that's not always that's not always the right approach. Um, I've found that I've found that um, well, well, you know, talking about these things as if as if it really is as as if the investigation of theology is really an adventure, because of course that's exactly what it is. It's 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 a it's an intellectual adventure. Now that adventure has moral purpose. It matters what you find and how you find it, but the fact is, it, it's it's a kind of a journey, and uh, I think I think more of us uh, could do a lot more to get young people interested in in at least asking those questions. You know, I, I think it's not it's not for me to prescribe answers necessarily for uh, for for young people who I don't know and who don't know me but at the very least you can prescribe questions <laughs> you know and um and and let's face it uh, this this the, the the culture we're living in now mainstream culture doesn't even it never minded not having good answers it doesn't even have good questions to be honest and and that's really the thing a friend of mine told me if they can get you asking the wrong questions it doesn't matter what the answer is. Mm -hmm. And so that that's where we are. We're, we're, we're a society, we're a civilization that is asking the wrong questions. And so it doesn't matter what the answer is. Um, you, you, you were asking what it was that uh, uh, when someone has recently discovered their faith, finding out what it was that triggered them, because yeah. it's, it's really significant. It, yes. It's like, is it something I can use to work on other people? It's the same about waking up to 
the lies, the pandemic, the you know the the other big questions in life, the more political ones, as to why people wake up to the fact that they've been lied to. Yes. It's really, really difficult to put your finger on the thing that woke people up. But there's always, I, I always liken it to a tapestry, there's always one thread that's loose. And if you pull that out, the mm. whole thing comes apart. But it is finding that one thread. And, and this is as true of... of um, of discovering your faith as it is of waking up politically, finding yes. that thread. And it, it's going to be different in everyone. That's right. If it was a simple matter of it being the the, the apex thread in each of us, right. that we're always in the same place, <laughs> it would be so easy. It'd be you so just easy. go up and you tug that thing. But you've got to find, you've got to find that, that point in everyone. And it, it, it's, again, why Christianity is difficult, not easy, and and long may it be that way. I wouldn't want it any other way. Well, that's right. If it listen, if it if it were easy, it would probably be worthless. And mm -hmm. that's that's another thing I'm always saying. You know, in one of the one of the precepts, as you know, um, is is uh, deny the self. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Denied That's the it. one that really resonated with me because all, all, all those others are sort of like, yeah, yeah, you can understand that. But denying the self, that's actually that's tough, uh, counterintuitive. And yes, that's sir. a challenge. Yes, sir. Exactly. And, and that's the thing. Um, you know, if if you if you give in to the part of yourself that doesn't really want to put the work in, then you can always find some low quality solution. But mm -hmm. it's a low quality solution, <laughs> you know, um, anything that doesn't cost you something, everything, anything that doesn't demand anything of you is is almost guaranteed to be worthless. I, I recently gave up a quite bad video game habit. I was playing an online game, one of these city building things that's yes. free to play. And it, it, I was just seeing myself turn into someone I, I didn't respect. It was like, <laughs> you are spending much too much time on this thing. It's like, oh, I just got to open it up and uh, collect the resources for the day and, uh, and collect my daily bonus. An hour later, I'm still building a, a, a new... Um, a, I don't know what yeah, it was, a yeah. tree factory thing. Yeah, <laughs> or the, yeah. uh, so um, my <laughs> wife was similarly playing another game, and we both agreed. We said, look, this is not good. We're no. spending too much of our time doing this. And we both agreed we were going to ditch it that day. Yeah. Uh, and it was almost like, well, I just want to finish the... Uh, she said, no, 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 you can't even <laughs> think like that. If you're going to do it, whatever it was you were saving up for within that game doesn't matter. You do it now. And I did it, and it's such a weight off my shoulders. <laughs> but this, this, this is giving up something I knew was not good for me. And you know what I'm doing instead? I'm reading, I'm reading the Bible a bit more. There you go. I mean, uh, that, there's, there's the payoff. There you go. Yeah. This is, it's, it's so great to talk to you. I've been wanting to talk to you for a while, and even more after, uh, after I listened to that, uh, the talk that you and Danny did on Infinite Jigsaw about, uh, about Brave New World. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, I, I've known about your art for a while. Um, actually, before we go any further, the website or websites people can go to to find out about your, your gatherings, where, or what are those websites? Okay, so the, um, uh, they're quite easy URLs. The, the uh, third Wednesday, which meets on the third Wednesday of every month, the website for that is libertariandrinks.com. Mm -hmm. um, Thursday Circle is a similarly uh, easy one. That's, uh, let me just make sure it's .com and not toad at UK. Uh, yeah, thursdaycircle.com. Mm -hmm. Um and my own website is dellingpolestudio.co.uk. Okay. And that, and that's where my paintings are. Um, nothing to do with my faith or anything like that. It's just my my obsession with military uniforms, which is a conversation for another day. Yeah, and I have to say that it's it's worth anyone who's listening to this. It is worth your time to to visit uh, Delling Pole Studios website. Uh, um, you really do some 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 great work. I remember seeing. I think I think Danny had bought some of these uh, 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 these cigarette cards that yeah, you I made with I, the watercolors. Yeah, I turned them into cigarette cards yeah. at, the, at the end, and uh, yeah. that they they sell better than the prints. I mean, yeah. I don't do it for the money. It's nice to earn a bit of money, but uh, it, it's a form of meditation for me. Uh, yeah. After an hour of intense watercolor with a bit of music in the background, I, I'm I'm in a much better place. That is great. Do you do any? Uh, do you do any teaching, or do you work with young people? Uh, 
You know what? I, 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 someone said, oh, I could get you some teaching at the local university. And I said, you, you do realize I'm um, considered to be quite right wing. I don't even mean then, uh, I, I don't even mean with the universities. I mean, just informally in the community, tutoring, what have you. Um, it, it, it's it's quite a tricky it's quite a tricky thing. I'd be more than happy to do so, but mm -hmm. the, the the point was with this university thing was they were saying, oh, well, there's no way they'd let you through the door if yes. they knew you were vaguely right wing. Correct. The, the whole the whole of the educational establishment and nearly all my artist friends are are robustly left wing, yeah. and it, it, it's. It, it's laughable, really, but yeah. you know, I, I, to be honest, I, I've got enough things going on. I, I, I haven't got enough time to do that, yeah. uh, and I do spread myself very thinly already. But yeah. uh, for me, it, it's kind of a person. It's almost like doing an illuminated manuscript for a month. Mm. You know, it, 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 it's there making something beautiful that I enjoy doing. Uh, it, it's a little bit of a little bit of me time in a way. Yeah. Um, but it's something I like to share with people. Um, yeah, it, it's just another one of those um, things that I do uh, that there's far too many of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's it, yeah. It does sound like you've got a you've got a full calendar most most weeks, but that's a that's a yeah. Good I kind of like it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good thing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You've been you've been so generous with your time. Again, I've I've wanted to talk with you for a long time, and um, I'd known about Third Wednesdays for a while. But uh, the other circle is at least as interesting as Third Wednesdays and might even be more fruitful in the end. What do you see? I mean, I'm in the U.S. I follow U.S. politics, of course. I also follow U.K. politics. And I know that, that you all are not in a good way uh, right now. Worse um, by the week. Worse by the week. Yeah. Are you optimistic or pessimistic or are you guardedly optimistic or do you do you feel we're just at the beginning of this thing what's your when, when you think about you know the, the months and the years to come what do you see as a christian i'm optimistic um politically i'm pessimistic because mm. i don't see people waking up quickly enough to do anything about it mm. and by the time they do they're going to have to take part in a a broken uh, democratic system. Democracy is dead. That they, they, they've they've corrupted the voting system to a point whereby it's almost meaningless. And the people you've got the opportunity of voting for are all rogues anyway. So you've kind of got this situation where even if you did wake up, it would be too late to do anything about it. And I think the answer doesn't lie in traditional politics. And uh, I think people growing in their rediscovery of faith will inevitably happen. And I think there will come a point where there's such a groundswell of, uh, of normal people who have worked out that they don't need that system anymore, that I think some form of revolution will take place. Not a traditional revolution, but mm. uh, I think... I think things, unexpected things will happen. I know that's a real cop-out, because of course unexpected things will happen. But, but uh, I, I think there's going to be factors that aren't in play as yet are going to come into play. And, and they are ultimately what's going to sort this out. Because it's coming to a head, whether that's in 10 years or a month, it, it, the things are going to come to a head. I think that's right. Well, certainly, if, if you look at if you look at Christianity itself, we have to remember that this 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 is a faith that was born uh, in the shadow of a giant, cruel, immensely powerful pagan empire, which mm -hmm. is the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple thousand years later, you still had Christianity, but you didn't have any Roman Empire. So, mm -hmm. so it's early days yet, you know. Yeah, um, I mean, if you were to say to the early Christians, how do you see this panning out? Would um, the Roman Empire adopting Christianity and then ultimately <laughs> being overrun by barbarians, mm -hmm. uh, do, do you think that would have been on the list of options? No, uh, I don't not. think so. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a that's a good way to to to, to round this out. Thank you well, again. Well, it's flown by this time. It, really it has. has. It I, has. I really do enjoy talking to you, Mike, and we'll have to do it again sometime in, in the not too distant future. We've got to do it again, absolutely. So all the best to you and to your circles, <laughs> you know. And um, we'll talk again soon. Cheers, then, Mike. All right, take care.